So uh, let me start with some background. Uh, many of you have been working on mobile health, right? Uh, a mobile health system uh, usually deals with at least one of these aspects. Uh, first, how to choose the right sensors and how to design algorithms to collect uh, health-related data. Right? Uh, second is how to transform such data into knowledge. Uh, for example, models uh, that people can use to treat disease, right? Or uh, something that we can provide uh, to the users or professionals that they can take action to improve their health. So um, certainly there has been a lot of excitement around using uh, uh, machine learning techniques for mobile health. Um, so there has been significant uh, progress in machine learning field uh, in terms of algorithms, uh, in terms of uh, how to actually apply AI to different fields. Um, but today I'm going to focus the uh, bad and ugly aspects of AI for uh, uh, mobile health. Um, although we have seen a lot of uh, progress in this field, uh, which has enabled a whole range of advanced algorithms that can run on today's off-the-shelf mobile devices, and uh, many of them are for actually uh, health-related applications. But uh, I, I, in my opinion, um, we still face a couple of challenges, uh, which are a lack of data and also uh, data privacy. So let's take a look at a couple of uh, news recently. Um, on the left, this is the uh, story on Google's medical AI. Um, that has been shown uh, not very accurate uh, in a large field study, uh, field trial actually in Thailand. Uh, so the AI technology was used to scan uh, diabetic uh, retin uh, uh, <coughs> retinopathy. Basically you take a picture of the eye and try to detect whether this person has uh, diabetes. Right? Uh, this, this has been done routinely by uh, uh, you know, specialists, but it can take a few days. Um, in reality, this AI is supposed to uh, pick up the disease in just a matter of minutes, right? By just uh, uh, image processing techniques. But uh, as a matter of fact, uh, many of the images were rejected uh, simply because the quality of the uh, images were too low. So, um, on, on the right, we can see a, another news story, uh, which says this is Amazon workers are listening to um, your conversations, try to label the data. Um, that actually just confirmed long-term suspicion. Right? Um, we also hear, you know, other stories uh, that uh, applications of AI is not so successful. Uh, for example, uh, IBM Watson Health project was not doing so well, at least in the field of uh, oncology. Uh, keep in mind here, we're actually talking about uh, either image processing or language, natural language processing, right? Which are actually considered to be most developed, uh, most mature fields of, of AI, right? Uh, for many cases of health uh, data, um, we actually face even bigger challenges because this data not only hard to label, um, but in some cases are just hard to access, right? Because of extreme, uh, extremely sensitive nature of, of this data. So I will briefly touch upon uh, these challenges um, from some of our experience uh, on, on, on a couple of projects. So first project has to do with running. Um, running is a very popular exercise, as we know. Um, so here we'll focus on studying running rhythm, uh, which can quantify the le uh, level of coordination between breathing and stress. Uh, as uh, new runners, uh, I sometimes find myself uh, gasping for air, right, if I run just for a short period of time, um, simply because I don't have good coordination between breathing and my first steps. And this is a, how we actually define uh, running rhythm uh, formally. So basically it's defined as a number of strides uh, during a whole uh, breathing cycle. 
<clears throat> and to actually measure or improve something like that, uh, there are actually professional uh, equipment like uh, CPAD. Um, uh, the professional runners regularly use this uh, such uh, equipment to help them measure the uh, you know uh, lung capacity, their uh, running efficiency, things like that. Uh, our goal here uh, is to design a system um, which is called the uh, run body uh, that can help people to measure and uh, measure the level of coordination uh, during running. Uh, basically. Uh, from this app, you can see uh, it measures the frequency of running, uh, frequency of footsteps, and frequency of breathing, and then calculate uh, the rhythm of running. And uh, this is uh, how we actually do it. Um, first, uh, we do a one-time training process. Uh, users can basically breathe into a phone, uh, breathe, uh, into a uh, Bluetooth ear set uh, connected to your phone and uh, the signature of the breathing was recorded. And then during running, um, we can extract features and then uh, using a simple algorithm, causing similarity to detect breathing. Uh, this is done through uh, sound uh, from, from the Bluetooth uh, microphone. Uh, however, the challenge here is, as we know, uh, this uh, acoustic data is often very noisy, right? Especially when we're running against the wind uh, in outdoor or we're running uh, a treadmill uh, in a gym, there's a lot of noise around, okay? So uh, we can see example here, uh, if we run uh, in a very quiet uh, environment, can see uh, a lot of uh, peaks, right? This actually can correspond to uh, uh, inhale, inhalation, uh, this is the ground truth. Uh, basically, very, uh, very easy to detect breathing, right? Just through maybe uh, some uh, uh, peaking algorithm and so on. But if you run, you're running on public road, uh, you can see a lot of noise uh, that can lead to false alarms, things like that. Okay? Uh, simply because there, there's a lot of uh, cars, traffic, uh, other people and so on. Uh, around this, this uh, runner. So to improve this accuracy, right, the always these challenges I just shown, uh, we try to utilize this model uh, called locomotor respiratory coupling or LRC. Uh, this model says uh, for any human, uh, there only exists a small number of integer ratios uh, between breathing and uh, uh, running steps. Okay? Uh, no matter how fast or how slow you run, uh, you can only achieve one of these uh, ratios. Uh, this is a very, very interesting phenomenon and which actually exists for many mammals, including humans. Now, based on this uh, knowledge, we actually can uh, try to improve the accuracy of, of detecting breathing and uh, the ratio of breathing uh, of, of steps. Okay, so this is the basic idea. So, uh, we can, uh, based on one of these uh, possible ratios from LRC model, we can generate uh, simulated breathing signals. And then um, together uh, with the detected breathing, uh, we can apply a, a simple procedure called cross correlation. Uh, that can give you the most likely ratio of LRC. And I also give the uh, rest of the details, and uh, we, we actually implement this algorithm and the app uh, in a world at Mobicom a few years ago. So uh, to evaluate the system, we recruited uh, uh, 13 subjects uh, for total uh, number of uh, almost 40 runs. Uh, some of them are uh, non-runners, uh, they never run. Uh, some of them just run occasionally and just one uh, regular runner. So you can look at this uh, result here. For this regular runner, um, the LRC is very st stable, uh, except for the short period where he stopped. Uh, and basically, no matter you know, how fast uh, he runs, uh, the LRC is always, is always stable. Uh, this actually confirms uh, uh, actually a common knowledge. Um, but for non-runners, you can see their LRCs are all over the place. Uh, so the next step for this project was to develop uh, a way for users to 
not only keep track of the uh, LRC and the running with them, but also try to coordinate their breathing uh, with their steps. Um, now, the next project uh, is about taking this uh, breathing monitoring technology to next step, uh, try to develop something that can help uh, to treat diseases. Um, one of the uh, serious diseases is called COPD, uh, which is uh, actually one of the leading cause of death around the world because of aging population. Um, so one of the exercises uh, doctors usually uh, give patients is something like this. Uh, you can inhale one, two, and exhale one, two, three, four. Uh, the goal is to extend the inhalation period, uh, trying to restore the lung capacity. And this is a more sophisticated uh, uh, breathing exercise. Uh, it's called uh, uh, RSABT. Um, so, the basic, really, the basic idea is try to uh, breathe in sync with your heartbeat changes. Okay? And this uh, exercise has been shown to be effective uh, not only to uh, treat uh, pulmonary diseases, but also to uh, uh, mitigate uh, stress, things like that. Uh, however, uh, such uh, breathing exercise uh, is usually done in a clinical setting uh, with the help of uh, therapist and also uh, equipment like this that measures the uh, physiological signals. So, the so first, uh, we try to uh, measure uh, breathing signal uh, using a single variable device. Okay? So, this time, not only we measure the frequency, but also we try to get the real time phase of breathing cycle. You can look at this figure, right? We know where actually the uh, breathing progresses over time. Okay. Um, so the basic idea is when a person is uh, sitting, um, the breathing actually can cause slight movement of forearm and wrist. Okay. By, by using this uh, smartwatch, uh, we can pick up this movement uh, and try to derive a uh, signal of breathing. And I will skip the details. And based on that, uh, as we also we know, the uh, PPT sensor in variable can measure heartbeat, right? So altogether, we can uh, uh, we can develop this exercise called the RSABT just using uh, wearable single wearable device. Um, but in order to give people feedback, uh, we actually designed a VR game um, like this. Uh, so. The user actually can see on the VR uh, uh, goggle that the real time breathing uh, of herself, but also the recommended breathing pattern. And uh, basically, she's trying to actually match those two. Uh, we actually tried other uh, game designs, like you can fly an airplane using your uh, breathing and so on. Okay, so second part of my talk uh, has to do with data privacy. Uh, the technology we leverage here is called uh, federal learning, uh, which has been a very hot topic uh, in machine learning community. Uh, so the basic idea here is that we can allow the nodes uh, or different devices to collaboratively train models uh, without sharing data. Uh, uh, the whole purpose is to, uh, to preserve the privacy of user data, uh, but at the same time try to achieve some common goal of learning. Uh, this is a very basic uh, algorithm developed by, uh, first developed by Google that has been widely uh, used. Um, so basically each node here try to uh, first uh, train a local model okay, and send the model to a server and the server just do a single, uh, simple average uh, of the model parameters and send back to the nodes and those can update this model using uh, their uh, local data again, and this process continues until uh, uh, convergence. Okay. So first, uh, this, this algorithm uh, actually preserves privacy uh, because no data is shared. Okay. However, in terms of the accuracy of the model you learn, uh, it's usually pretty bad, um, especially when the data distribution or property across different nodes are very different. So this is from uh, one of our projects 
uh, where we try to uh, detect family routine activities using sensors like uh, microphone and motion uh, sensors. Uh, so here you can see uh, the performance across different families is very different. Uh, no matter what uh, classifiers we use, we applied uh, five, six different classifiers uh, end up with very similar results. Uh, you can see some of the families here are pretty uh, uh, bad in terms of the accuracy. Uh, so we basically find out uh, these families have multiple children, okay? Uh, as we know, children can cause a lot of noise, right? But also in terms of the routine, uh, for example, the number of frequency of dinners and things like that are very different uh, when you have multiple kids in the, in the home. Uh, so basically this uh, gives us intuition that uh, a single global model that can be learned across different nodes uh, may not be very, very good. So the second idea here uh, that this is also from literature is called uh, multitask learning. Uh, the, basically we'll try to learn multiple models from uh, different nodes. And uh, uh, basically the server will aggregate those models into multiple of them okay, and send it back. And those uh, local uh, those nodes can improve these models locally and then send it back. Uh, now, there has been a lot of data, uh, uh, study that shows this can uh, indeed improve the accuracy. Uh, but the challenge here is that in order to capture the uh, basically the common features or relationship between different nodes, uh, you need to send more information than just uh, local models. A uh, common approach is to share a linear combination of raw data. This can lead to a high risk of uh, privacy breach because uh, you can actually reconstruct part, at least part of the model from such uh, linear combination. So we have been uh, working on a new approach uh, called the clustered multitask better learning. Uh, the idea here is that uh, nodes um, will first uh, learn uh, models locally, uh, send the model to the server, but so we're trying to actually cluster these models, okay? So basically you share uh, this cluster relationship uh, with different nodes, okay? Without, uh, and unlike multitask learning, you don't share a uh, combination of data. You share the relationship or structure of the clusters. Okay? Um, this can actually can allow us to export a uh, special temporal correlation of data uh, this is actually very common in, in, in health scenarios uh, and also capture the cluster structure among those. So this is some of the uh, results we uh, 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 obtained from a large data set uh, that consists of uh, 30 individuals, uh, different activities, including sitting, walking, uh, walking upstairs, downstairs, standing, leaning, and so on. Uh, try to classify different activities. Um, but uh, once we, here we apply uh, uh, different federal learning algorithms. Uh, for the global uh, algorithm, basically we try to learn a single uh, classif uh, classifier uh, using, uh, uh, through the collaboration with those nodes. Uh, apparently, uh, you can see the accuracy is not so good, although it increased a little bit, we will have more and more training data. Um, basically, um, this is because of, uh, people actually walk or uh, uh, walk upstairs, downstairs very differently, uh, depending on the age, uh, weight, and so on. Uh, this is the performance of a local model uh, where each node trains the model uh, independently, just using their, their own data. And finally, here is our approach. Uh, you can see uh, just with very little data, we actually can achieve uh, quite a good performance. Okay. All right, so um, with that, um, I'd like to conclude this talk. Um, the takeaway message is, first, uh, we can actually export uh, physiological or biological models uh, from uh, established um, uh, theories like uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, medical models that we can use. Um, basically, we can remove the need of a, a large amount of data for training. Okay? Uh, second, 
federal learning can preserve privacy. Uh, however, in order to improve accuracy at the same time, uh, we need, need better ways to capture relationship between data of different individuals, uh, which is actually still a, a very active area of research. Okay, so with that, I will be happy to take uh, any questions.